I drink your milkshake. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where this week we conclude our epic exploration into Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a writer, producer, and host here in San Diego, California, and uh, excited to be going back in to the uh, oil fields of There Will Be Blood for a third uh, part here and a final part for this uh, episode, for the show. And I'm very excited to welcome back to our microphones yeah, Emmy Award-winning sound editor from Skywalker Sound, John Grieber. Welcome back to the Cinephiles. Hey, my guys. It's good to be back. Um, I've missed it, so I'm, I'm happy to be back here with you guys. Um, well, I, I don't know if I've exactly missed the world of Daniel Plainview, but I certainly have missed talking about it with you two. <laughs> this, is, this is why I'm broken, because I don't know why I gravitate towards dysfunctional worlds, but I, I do. And so, uh, yeah, well, I miss at, it. at the moment, we're going to gravitate towards the <laughs> arguably one of the most dysfunctional <laughs> moments, because Daniel Plainview has just murdered his ersatz brother not brother henry and has buried the body and is drunken himself into a stupor mm. the light fades to black and then we wake up to the sound of a gunshot Who's it? and he wakes up and i don't know if the gunshot is a real gunshot or if it's the gunshot of his memory of killing his not brother oh yeah i don't know what it or it's a dream i don't know what it is but right. he wakes and there standing over him is Bandy, mm -hmm. who's the actor is Hans Haus. I think he's great in this part. God damn. And I love Daniel Day Lewis's, and we've all had this of like trying to put your brain back together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when you've been woken up and like going, okay, what do I have to do here? Now he's got a, he's in a business deal. Yeah, I'd like to lease your land. I had asked for you to come and talk to me before. My boy's been very sick. This was before your boy got sick. Just catching him in a lie right at the beginning. There's like a confidence and a yeah. all togetherness of Bandy. Like yeah. he, he sees he sees everything. God has told me what you must do. What is that? You should be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And what does he try to do? He tries to buy his way out. Three thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. Be baptized. Be forgiven for this sin that you've done. What sin are you uh, referring to, Mr. Bandy? My, my sin of drilling? Like, because I'm a businessman? Is right. that what right. the problem is? Clueless. Bandy reaches into his pocket and holds something out for him, and it's the gun. Mm -hmm. So does Bandy know? Did Bandy find the body? How much does Bandy oh, yeah. know? He knows. Yeah. He for sure knows. Yeah. I think so, too. Yeah. That is such a moment. That is such an unexpected moment. I mean, Bandy yeah. showing up at all is unexpected. And then we hear pre-lap, we have the, the sound of the next scene, mm -hmm. and we hear Eli say, I truly wish everyone could be saved, don't you? Yes. 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 I'm afraid that's just not the case. And we're at the church. No. You will never be saved if you reject the blood. And of course, the title of the movie is There Will Be Blood. Mm. And so it, the blood is the blood of Christ, but the blood is also the oil. And, yeah. the, and you know what else the blood is that just occurred to me in this moment because we were just talking about it? Mm. The blood is family. Yeah. That's oh, blood. Point. Yeah. And, the blo and he doesn't have the ties of blood to his false family members. Is there a sinner here looking for salvation? No response. I'll ask it again. Is there a sinner here looking for God? Yes. I can't say enough about da what Daniel Day-Lewis does in this scene. I mean, his performance throughout the entire movie is astounding, but this scene is otherworldly, what he does. Daniel, are you a sinner? Yes. Oh, the Lord can't hear you, Daniel. Say it to him. Go ahead and speak to him. It's all right. Yes. Down on your knees. And what's so crazy about this scene is on the one hand, it's performative. Daniel doesn't believe in God. 
He's not here to be saved. He's putting on an act yep. because this is what he needs to do to get his pipeline, which is what he wants. On the other hand, this is 100% fucking real. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What do you want me to say? You've come here and you've brought good and wealth, but you have also brought your bad habits as a backslider. You've lusted after women. And this is the fucking moment, man. And you have abandoned your child. Oh, this is this moment is what won in the uh, the Oscar. Yeah. I think this this is the scene because uh, of all people, Eli is the one that breaks him down. Of all people in front of the church, um, of all people, the 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 charlatan, the the faker, is the one that strips uh, him naked in front of the church and exposes his vulnerability. And having him yell. I've abandoned my boy. I've abandoned my boy. That was the one. I've abandoned my boy. Um, and he gets him there. So it's such a complicated film because you're like, Eli is a, a bit of a joke of a human being, but look at the power he actually possesses in this space, in this well, church. Well, it's right? that seesaw, right? Yeah. He didn't have any power before, but now, right. now. Those, the thing has, the seesaw has turned because of this discovery. Does he know? Does he know what Bandy knows? That's a good that question. Is not, no, really it good doesn't question. even matter. Does it? Oh, you say no question. He does know. No, no. I, I said that's a, a good question. I well, said it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't know that it matters either way. If he knows, well, then Daniel's screwed in a way. <laughs> anyway, I kind of feel like maybe he doesn't. It doesn't even matter. He just knows he's here and he's agreed yeah. to this. Something is happening. And he's like, nope, now you are going to be in my house and you're going to get exactly what you have been giving to me. It yeah. is just propagating the cycle that's just going to get worse and worse. Yeah. Well, and I think this is the thing about Eli is like, we can say that he's a charlatan and we can say that he's filled with ego and all these things. He's good at this, mm -hmm. whatever the fuck this is. And there are times people, I think, again, people went through this process of being baptized with him and that changed them. That helped them. You know, now I, again, I'm an atheist, but that doesn't mean that people, I believe that people aren't, being saved on some level mm. by an experience like this. And and there's a watch, like I watched this scene multiple times, just mm. trying to figure out like what the fuck is happening. And I think there's a moment where he is trying, it, it's such a weird thing he's trying to do, which mm. is he doesn't believe he's trying to perform yeah. as if he's having the experience that he knows he's supposed to have. Say it louder, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Louder, Daniel, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. I am sorry, Lord. I am sorry, Lord. I want the blood. I want the blood. And then it becomes the experience. Right, it becomes real. You have abandoned your child. I've abandoned my child. I will never backslide. I will never backslide. I was lost, but now I am found. I was lost, but now I'm found. I have abandoned my child. And then it just explodes out of him. I abandoned my child. Say it louder. Say it louder. I've abandoned my child. I've abandoned my child. I've abandoned my boy. Like it's totally fucking real. And he begs for the blood. And mm. then, but then this is the other key moment is he says, Just Give me the blood, Eli. Let me get out of here. Give me the blood, Lord. And let me get away. Because he doesn't want to face it. Mm -hmm. He's too scared. It's mm. too painful. This is, in some ways, this is what he needs. Like he needs that therapeutic moment to accept who he is and then go reunite with his kid. But right. he goes, Give me the blood and let me get out of here. And then Eli says, Get out of here, devil! And slaps him. Yes. So by the way, this was shot, I think, either the day after or two days after the scene where he puts him into the mud. And <laughs> the payback, son. Yeah, because yeah. he and I think this is brilliant. Is Paul Thomas Anderson didn't want too much space. He didn't want that to linger too long before Paul Dano essentially got his revenge. I have a very strange thought about what I think happens in this slap. Mm. First of all, Paul Dano slaps are not nearly as scary as Daniel Day Lewis's <laughs> slaps. Yeah, true. He's got a small hands, man. He's got small hands. Plain view <laughs> after the first slap smiles. Yeah. I have a thought about what I think's going on. Do you, would you you do you have thoughts before I say mine or do you want to hear mine? Please go ahead. I think he's thrilled that he got slapped because I think 
that is where he sees Eli's bullshit. Mm. That's where he sees, oh, you're doing this for revenge. You're not, because there was a moment where he was feeling it, where he was, oh my right. God, this is really, him. it scared and the shit out of him. But when he gets slapped, he goes, oh no, I did have <sighs> you pegged. Mm -hmm. I don't have to take this seriously. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and slap. He likes being slapped. Yeah. Um, he actually says, That's there it is. is. I, I never thought about that before. That's mm -hmm. spot on. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your savior? Yes, I do. The water is poured over him and he stands up. It's over. Our yeah. baptism is over. And he stands up and he shakes Eli's hand and he gets very close to him. And we do not know what he says. Right. We don't know what he says. I love that. Yeah. And I, I think he says, you're full of shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I think that's the moment. And he's greeted by all the parishioners because now he's one of them. He's been bathed in the blood of Christ. Right. And they hug him and they call him brother. And this is the thing. It's like, again, I'm an atheist. But this, too, is real human connection that mm -hmm. he had the opportunity to have. Yeah. But he can't have it. Even oh. Mary comes over and hugs him. Yeah. And he says, Mary, my sweet Mary. Right. Yeah. So it's a really powerful moment. You don't know, right, how much of this is true, how much of it isn't. Is he, This is our speculation, whether he's like, you know, like you said, Steve, at the beginning, he was kind of making fun of it. Then he, he does get broken down and then and then has that final exchange with Eli. Is he telling him this is all bullshit or is he saying to him, you'll get your money, uh, you know, or is he saying to him, are we, are we done? We're done now. We're done now. I don't know. But all kinds of things are possible, which is why it's great. Or is he ratcheting it up another level? Mm. No. Fuck you. You're never getting the money now. Or whatever. <laughs> whatever right, he, that's possible. Is he going to yeah. take it? I, I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's like the um, awesome translation moment. We'll never know. Uh, our, our patron, Ryan Lieb, uh, mm. actually is asking very much the questions we've been discussing. What is Daniel thinking during the baptism? He does seem to truly surrender to the experience to some degree. Is there catharsis? Do you think... Being cleansed, in a sense, was something that he desperately needed. And he asked, what do you think he says Ooh. to Eli? Now, I think we've been talking to these points. Mm -hmm. um, but then he, asked, then he asked an additional question. He says, Daniel Day-Lewis has joked that his wife has had to live with some very strange men. Can you imagine living with Daniel Day-Lewis <laughs> in character as Daniel Playview for several months in the present day? What do you think that was like? <laughs> Um, I think all our wives or girlfriends have had to live with very strange men. I'll just put that on the table. <laughs> That's a fair point. <laughs> Especially if you've been with someone for such a long time, uh, male or female, we all transition depending on our times in our lives. So yeah, I, I, I have no doubt that many women would say that. <laughs> well, and, and we don't have the, uh, it's just a character to hide behind, you know, yeah, right. Daniel Day Lewis could say, Oh no, I was just being a right. character. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they're, true. they're building the pipeline uh by the way everything that we see in this film was painstakingly researched this is all of this is really how they did these things they tried very hard to be accurate and then hw comes home and he picks him up and he's carrying him and he's introducing him around and he puts him down and they're walking together shows yeah. him the pipeline and, and what's interesting about this is he still can only relate to HW through as his business partner in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Look, see, here's the pipeline we're working on. Yeah. And he embraces HW, and HW does not hug him back. I love you, son. HW takes a step back and slaps him. <laughs> like Eli. Yeah, two <laughs> slaps in a row. And then just starts hitting him. Yeah. Uh, it's so... It's such a painful moment for me. It really is. I clearly had blocked it out of my memory of existing. Um, uh, that's just a pain point in, in, in a couple of ways, because like we said, we, we believe he does love him. He does mm -hmm. want this easy child. Like if an easy child can work, he wants to do it. Even though he's so willing to tackle adversity in his professional life, couldn't do it in his personal life. I yeah. do believe that he loves him, but of course, he has forever alienated this boy, who's not his son anyway. Well, you know what? As, a, as the parent of an adopted son, he is his son. Mm. Well, I didn't mean to imply that. No, no, I'm not. I wasn't, inf yeah. I wasn't offended, but I, that's not what I mean. I just mean yeah. to say that, like, you raised him from a baby. It's your son, you know? Mm. But like, did he know what? Did he raise him as a baby or was that other guy raising him? No, but from that point from forward, that point. he yeah. definitely did. That's fair. 
So a subject that has come up in some of the greatest films we've ever explored, including The Godfather and Citizen Kane, is these men who are incapable of love or need love, but don't know how to express love. And I think Charles Foster Kane is a different version of that from Michael Corleone. They're different. And I think this is another different one, is that love, to some degree, means accepting pain. Love means accepting vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Love means caring for someone even at a time where it's painful to do so. Love me. There's all these things that love means that Daniel Plainview is unwilling to accept, mm -hmm. you know, even though that's in fact what he needs. Yeah. And it's a weird thing in life to say like, oh, no, pain is what you need. Sharing this pain with this kid, that's what you need. That's what, that's how love manifests itself at times. Mm -hmm. It's totally true, though. I mean, the, he, there is no human relationship that's only positive or that's only easy, that's worth anything, you know, especially with a child. It's, it's, there's a lot of pain. And he, you're right. He rejects it. He chooses to reject that trial or that dealing with pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's being punished for it now. From well, and, and let's take it a step forward. What is our what is the our introduction to Daniel Plainview, a man who can overcome pain, mm -hmm. physical pain, struggle, adversity. He has the strength to overcome that. Yeah. He's emotional pain. He doesn't. Mm. Let's get some decent food inside of you. That's all we need here is a good, strong, expensive meal. Let's solve our problem with money. Yeah. And he orders two steaks and a whiskey and some goat's milk. And he's talking to him. I don't know if H.W. is reading lips very well at this point. So I don't know if H.W. understands anything he's saying, but he's trying to make amends in a way. He says, we're going to have this teacher help you. So I need you. I need your help. And he kisses him. I think he really is attempting in this mm -hmm. moment to yeah. connect. Yeah, he's trying to make it up to him. Yeah. And then some other people come into this restaurant and start <laughs> ordering. And those other people are the Standard Oil people. Hello, H.M. Tilford. You don't have to shout. And then, man, things get real, real weird. You could feel that all of Daniel's attention, which had been on HW, is now all on these people. And I don't know if he's embarrassed because of his deaf son. I don't know if he's still, you know, I don't know. There's a, there's a million things going on, I think. And the first one is, is that they get served some drinks before you did, before Daniel did, which I think we've all been in the restaurant where that's happened to us. Mm -hmm. um, and then the weirdest thing happens is he puts a napkin over his face and starts talking about the business deal and the pipeline. Why does he put a napkin over his face? Well, before he does that, he just stares at them. Yes, absolutely. So there is a building anger as he's watching them because... This is, in essence, the small businessman looking at the corporation, right? And there's a there's a natural – for some small business people, there's a natural anger at the corporation, at the corporation's getting treated better. You know, the, just having that, that – uh, just a few seconds ago where he's like, we ordered these drinks before they did. You know, yeah. he, he, he literally grabs them off the bar as an insult to the waiter yes. going like, fuck you. You know, you should have served us first. And so he stares at them and in his mind – he is creating this scenario that they think they're better than him. Mm -hmm. So the way to take them down a few pegs in his mind, because he's such a competitive, warped individual, is to make fun of them by wearing this sheet and use HW as the as his audience for making fun of them. And it's a desperate uh, attempt at getting attention from them because he could have just kept eating his food. And, and as John has pointed out many times, there are other avenues, other decisions he can make in these moments but he intent, but he instead decides on ta on ma on choosing violence every time uh, in these moments when he could very easily just move on. I think so. I the, putting the napkin over your face is is a very very strange thing. And mm -hmm. the thought that occurred to me is H W is deaf, but maybe can read lips. Is that oh, H W can't understand what he's saying if the napkin's over his face? Great point. Oof. I didn't think about that. I don't know if that's what it is. But he's looking right at him as he's saying these things. But that's a great point. I didn't think about the read lips. Hmm. 
Yeah. It's a really weird. And he gets up and the chair falls down and you could feel the tension yeah. and the and the violence in his body. I want you to look over there. Daniel, let me introduce. Look over there. You see? That's my son. You see him? Yes. You see? Him? I see him. You don't tell me how to raise my family. <clears throat> He's still back there. Oh yeah. You know, at this offhand comment this guy made that he is built up He's been stewing on this thing. I'm very happy for you. That yes, I made went. a deal with Union. My son is happy. He's safe. Congratulations. I'm taking care of him now, so... Excellent. You look like a fool, don't you, Tilford? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the, if you don't say yes, there is a very good chance I might kill you in this yeah. moment. And the guy says... Yes. Yes. And he drinks his whiskey and he walks away. Mm. There's an interesting thing. So we've had directors who love rehearsal. Uh, we've had directors who don't do any rehearsal. PTA doesn't like rehearsal. He doesn't mm. think there should be a lot of chit chat or discussion. He doesn't want to get too involved in what the actor's choices are. He thinks you hire the right actors. He has private conversations with them, talks through and around the script. But he says is you, what you don't want to do is over talk it. Mm. And, and what one of the great lessons of the cinephiles to me has been all of these directors are right. Mm. You know, like uh, Sidney Lumet, who did tons of rehearsal before Network, he was right. Mm -hmm. And Paul Thomas Anderson not wanting to do rehearsal with Daniel Dane Lewis and Paul Dano and let them just go at it, he was right too. Well, anyone that tells you there's the right way to direct the film, it's ridiculous. It's all a matter of what works for that director. And also those directors cast certain actors exactly. that are, you know, um, work with their process, like their process, you know. And he walks back to a table and he kisses HW. And the note I wrote down is that's not real love. No. That kiss is ownership. That kiss is a demonstration. Yep. It's not love. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I think HW is beginning to understand that because the camera stays on HW as yeah. he's processing what that moment was that just happened. And you see him kind of look around and blink and, and you seeing him like, this is, is this my future that he's just going to use me as a prop? And, and that you see it kind of dawning on him, you know, which is a shame. Oh. <laughs> a shame is an understatement. Yeah. Fair, <laughs> um, fair. Now we're going to kind of move forward in time. Eli is going off on a mission or something. Uh, we see H.W. with a teacher practicing sign language. Mm. And Mary is with him, and she too is practicing sign language. We have another scene with H.W. and Mary. And then we see a blonde woman all grown up in white. And this is H.W. marrying Mary. Mm. And it's 1927. Right. And there is no indication of whether or not Daniel Plainview is at this wedding. He might be. Yeah. And then we go from there to a mansion, mm. a bowling alley in a mansion where Daniel Plainview is shooting stuff. <laughs> like when you turn <laughs> the inside of your gorgeous mansion into a shooting gallery, yeah. you've made a you've made a quite a turn in life. <laughs> Um, by the way, this is Doheny Mansion. This is the mansion oh. built by the guy that Daniel Plainview is based on. Wow. Um, and really, it's not. It's really the character in Oil, the Upton Sinclair book, but but there's right. some connections there. And by the way, this mansion is used in everything. The It's like 100 movies and TV shows that are filmed at this mansion. It was wow. one of the most... It was the most expensive mansion built in California at its time. This is... Uh, Spider-Man, uh, I think Spider-Man 2 was shot here. Oh. Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties was shot here. Star Trek Into <laughs> Darkness was shot here. Charlie's Angels Full Throttle was shot here. Ghostbusters 2 was shot here. And this is also the home of the big Lebowski. Oh, Lebowski lives nice. at Doheny Mansion oh. 2. Nice. And when you watch Lebowski. When you when you watch him walk down that hallway, I can totally see Philip Seymour Hoffman. And a, in a, and a rug, you know, <laughs> that really ties the room together, <laughs> walking out. That's rad. Uh, so Sterling Jones, one of our patrons, writes, mm -hmm. when looking at Daniel Plainview's character, he seems to me that person who's really good at that one thing, but doesn't change nor wants to. Mm. He says, I think Daniel would consider being in a relationship as a waste of time. Near the end of the movie, you see that he's wealthy with that huge mansion. However, he's drunk, shooting up the fur furniture. Aside from the butler slash servant, and the Great Dane, there isn't anything else. 
Daniel's mansion is a house, not a home. Thoughts? Yeah. I think you're right. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. That's, that's I mean, is that a question? It's a <laughs> it's a cavernous museum of wealth where the only person who lives there or is there is to the point where they're shit face drunk and shooting shit in mm-hmm. the house. Like that is all you need to know. There is no nothing is happening there anymore that is productive. Nothing. Yeah. You know, I I. I I made it the reference before, but I got to go back. This is Xanadu. This is Charles Foster mm. Kane alone in Xanadu. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, you you have everything that anyone could ever want, and you have nothing. Right. You got it. Congrats. All your your tunnel vision worked. Here it is. Yeah. Enjoy. But you you knew Daniel. You knew all along of these opportunities. You're too smart to not have an idea or know a little bit right. that you chose poorly and you made consistent poor decisions because mm. you can't help yourself. Yeah. You're not in control. You cannot yeah. go the right way. And now here you are. And now here also is HW. Yeah. And HW has a translator. And this is a real deaf actor that they got, um, mm-hmm. whose name I had in front of me and now I can't find it. And he clearly has a prepared speech. This is hard for me to say. I'll tell you first. I love you very much. I don't, maybe he loves him and maybe he doesn't. I think he does. This is his father. Hold on. Steve, yeah. he said, this is very hard for me to say. Mm. Is it hard to say because it's a lie? No, obviously he's trying to say this is hard because of all the emotion, but right. yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he can. He, you know, uh, 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 emotionally or physically abused kids still have right. a connection yeah. right. to their yeah. parents. Yeah, they still, still love them. right because it's that because we have that within us. This yeah. and it's a natural instinctive thing of human beings to hope, right? It's it's uh, Andy Dufresne says it in Shawshank Redemption. They can't kill your hope. They can kill everything else, but they can't kill hope. And you all we all have it. And even in the most direst circumstances, that's how people survive sometimes who are in you know who are kidnapped or who are trapped or who are in these terrible situations it's the hope right and so even in these moments with him hw hopes in some way that daniel will finally break and connect with him and reveal himself to him and surrender his vulnerability so they can in, it create a new relationship um and finally he's reached this point where he can't anymore and he has to go be happy with mary i i think it's also Whenever you're going to have a difficult talk, you try to you try to take the kind step first. Mm. You try to reach out to connect, and the hope is that when you tell someone you love them, that they will love you back. Mm. You know, and he gets nothing from Plainview, and then he says, "Okay," that he basically says that he's going to Mexico because he's going to be an oil man on his own. He misses the job that he is what Daniel trained him to be. Yeah, and Daniel's response is. This makes you my competitor. Remember, Daniel has a competition in him. Right. And now his son is his competitor. I know you and I have disagreed over many things. I'd rather keep you as my father than my partner. He's saying we can have still have a loving relationship. Yeah. It, he's, I, uh, it gets offered to Daniel so many times. You got to ask yourself, how did H.W. grow up so well-adjusted in such horrific circumstances, right? I mean, because the he's essentially saying to Daniel one of the most emotionally intelligent things he can say. Yeah. He is giving Daniel the avenue, the space, the opportunity to create a better relationship with him. Don't. It's not like that. I've got to go make my own way, just like you did. I'm yeah. going to go try to make my own way and my own thing. Can't you respect that? Can't you appreciate that? And be my father, be my friend more than I was like, just be positive for me. And Daniel can't do it. And he reverts back to his infantile noises and, you know, dismissive grunts and words. And he wrecks the relationship in this moment. And yep. it's self-destructive. It's self-destructive. Daniel course, hates yeah. himself. Yeah. Daniel hates himself. That's yeah. very clear. Right. Yeah. You, you know what just occurred to me in answer to your question? Mm. What gives H.W. this strength, this emotional intelligence? It just hit me. Mm. It's Mary. Yeah, Mary. Is that he found, Mar- Mary says her father beats her. 
Yeah. Is that he found another kid who comes from an abused relationship and they found yeah. each other and they found love. And that's what yeah. gives him the emotional intelligence to to reckon with his childhood and to come back to the castle where the devil sits in his throne mm -hmm. and confront him with love. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he has an emotional familial ally for once. Yeah. yeah. He hasn't had it before, so now he does. Yeah. And Daniel probably sees that and resents and is jealous of that, too. Yeah, and John and Steve, this is such an integral thing because Daniel never had this woman no. love. He never had... Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe he's gay. I don't know. You know, he never had that partner with him to maybe push through all right. the, the nuttiness or to smooth the rough edges. Someone as tough as him to call him to task and to break him down and to turn him into a better person. H.W. has with Mary. And maybe there's even a little bit of jealousy from Daniel's point of view, seeing this beautiful romance instead of celebrating it. Yeah. Maybe he's even a little bit jealous. You, you know, it just hit me like a fucking freight train. Mm. What is the one thing that Daniel most strongly refuses to talk about? Where's HW's mother, his wife? He, he shuts right. that down every time it comes up. Yeah. I'm suddenly going, maybe there was a woman, not mm. HW's mother, but maybe HW and Henry aren't the first betrayals. Mm. Maybe, uh, maybe yeah. there's someone else. And, and all, that's, and maybe H.W. is his birth son or his, what, with this one. Maybe, yeah, maybe, oh, wow. Yeah. So he says, and the, the cruelty of Daniel Plainview in this scene is off the oh. charts, unbelievably, disgustingly painful. He yeah. says, then say it. If you've got something to say to me, then say it. I'd like to hear you speak instead of your little dog. Woof, 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 woof. And there's a long pause. And he says, I'm going to Netika with my wife. I'm going away from you. Those two lines, man. I'm go yeah. going to Mexico with my wife. I'm going away from you. You're killing us with what you're doing. You're killing my image of you as my son. And then we've gone from, you're killing us, you're killing my image of you as my son, to, you're not my son. He severs that last tie. Mm -hmm. And I think, watching it the first time, that I that, that caught me uh, like, just like, no, please don't do what you're about to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and, and H.W. takes it like it's a, uh, an expression, like it's just a tactic. He says, Please don't say that. I know you don't mean it. It's the truth. You're not my son. You never have been. You're no. You're no. Orphan. Did you ever hear that word? And he forces the translator to translate it into sign. And he says, I don't even know who you are because you have none of me in you. You're someone else's. Ugh. Jesus. I, I, I fear this. Uh, you know, you in the first part, you asked, you know, how does this feel raising, you know, because yeah. I have an adopted son. And I said, I certainly hope that my relationship never goes like this. <laughs> but the, the, there's, I see none of myself in you. Mm. Like there is a difference. And mm. I, I adore my son. Mm -hmm. We have a really close relationship, I think. But there's always going to be a thing, you know, right, right. that's a little bit different. You're an orphan from a basket in the middle of the desert. And I took you for no other reason than I needed a sweet face to buy land. God damn. And I think at the beginning, H.W. thought that this was just something he was saying to hurt him. And I think now he's going, this is the truth. Yeah. Look at me. You're lower than a bastard. You have none of me in you. You're just a bastard from a basket. And what does H.W. say? I thank God I have none of you in me. <laughs> and he stands up and walks out. Yeah. With his father or not father calling after him, things that he can't hear. The guy's deaf. He can't right. hear him yell, you're right. a bastard in a basket and repeating it. It is, it is among the most self-destructive moments I know of in any film. Mm -hmm. And destroy, destroy, hurting someone else too, but... Like what he does to himself yeah. by severing this relationship is awful. Bastard from a basket. Bastard from a basket. You're a bastard from a basket. 
it from a basket. And after this horrendous moment, the total destruction of their relationship, we cut to a flashback with H.W. as a kid and Mary's there and they're laughing and Daniel Plainview is smiling at them and he puts his hat, which I think is symbolic, on the kid's head. This is obviously a moment before the horrible accident mm. and Daniel Plainview looks back smiling at them and then walks up towards the derrick which is being built and there's no sync sound. It's just music. Why do you guys think we're cu cutting back to this moment? That seems a bit on the nose and not usually the Paul Thomas Anderson way of doing things. So maybe he felt like after a three hour movie or a two hour and 40 minute, like somewhere he felt like we need to reestablish the fact that this is a true tragedy. Uh, as you watch um, the son walk away and the father, when they, they were happy at some point, the pseudo father and the pseudo son were happy at some point, And now it's the end. And it's more like a reflection or reflection, a reflect back on when it could have been great and to see the tra to kind of underscore the tragic uh, ending of this relationship now. Yeah, it's, it's exactly like it's you just because we're in this super dysfunctional sort of finale, we can't forget that there was light here. And by bringing mm. that light in to your point, John, it just underscores how low we are now. Like yeah, it how didn't dark it is, have yeah. to go this way at all. Right. You could have supported your son, deaf or not. He would have been in love and you could both be rich drinking yeah. cocktails, but yep. no. <laughs> um, what I wonder, so there's two, two ways you can do this. There, and this came from years and years ago when we did um, Reservoir Dogs. Uh, Quentin Tarantino talked about the difference between a flashback and movies that are, sh are, are played out in a non-sequential order. Hmm. A flashback is something that somebody is thinking about in their past. Is Daniel Plainview, at this moment, after his son walked out, thinking about this moment of his kid oh. when he was yeah. young? Or is Paul Thomas Anderson, the filmmaker, showing us this moment? Oh, good point. Yeah, I've always felt it was Paul Thomas Anderson, the filmmaker, showing us, but it could very well be Daniel having this moment of, you know, because what we've done over these two and a, two parts and into this third part is we've kind of shown or seen that there is a humanity underneath Daniel and all his stuff. There's a genuine humanity, a genuine vulnerability, but he has layered bricks upon bricks of defense mechanisms and walls over himself to make sure that that isn't affected, yet it still does get affected. So maybe this is a moment where he's having a, a, a flash memory of when it could have been better, and it just kind of devastates him in a quiet way that it didn't end up in a good way, and maybe he's beating himself up even a little bit. And that's the thing about Daniel, like if he is going into a sentimental place, he will never let you see that he is mm. like. So I don't know that we'll ever know I, my gut instinct. I was sitting here shaking my head. No, no, it was that he's not thinking this. But then, yeah, he absolutely could be. But because of who he is, he's never going to show us in his performance that he's right. thinking this. So so right. it, it's up to us, I guess, to decide on that. Yeah. I, I think I've gone back and forth like 28 times <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which way this is. But like I think if it is a flashback, if he is thinking about this moment, it makes Daniel much more human. And if it is Paul Thomas Anderson, it is much he's much sad. He, like one is I'm thinking about this thing and that makes me sad. And that's mm -hmm. a really sad moment, but it's a human moment that we can relate mm -hmm. to. If he has completely blocked that out of his mind and yeah. the filmmaker is merely showing it to us to remind us he's barely human at this point, yeah. Yeah. you right. know? Um, which I mean, so, uh, the other evidence of what's happening right now would suggest that's awesome. We have mm -hmm. a shot of him just drunkenly struggling down some stairs and we hear prelap this audio from the next scene, Mr. Daniel, you've got a visitor and we yeah. cut to, Daniel Plainview passed out in the middle of the lane in the bowling alley. There's someone walking towards him. We don't quite see him at first dressed in black. He squats down and we realize that this is Eli. <laughs> Dr dressed in a beautiful suit with a big ass cross. You get it? I'm a religious person. Here's my big ass cross. You get it? 
Yeah. Is, is that sacrilegious, John? Saying Fuck yes. Big ass? Okay. I'm sorry. As a, <laughs> I apologize. As a as a somewhat practicing Catholic and Christian, yes, it's it's just to the audaciousness of having to showcase your faith to God is actually antithetical to right. how your your faith should be displayed right. uh, to God. So and yeah. Eli kind of dismisses the servant. Daniel is snoring. Mm. Eli shakes him, and I love that he says. Daniel Plainview, the house is on fire! <laughs> no reaction. <laughs> and then he says, Brother Daniel, it's Eli. And the snoring stops. Yeah. Like, that name and that voice <laughs> penetrates through the drunken haze. <laughs> and he looks up and says, yes, it is. I think where this movie has gone to, I is, you could never... And t- there's so many movies where I like go... Even if you don't anticipate what the end is, when you get there, you go, yes, of course, this is where we had to end up. You know, when the when mm-hmm. the T-Rex comes in to take out the velociraptors at the end of Jurassic Park, there's a moment of like, of course, yes, this is this is what it should be. This right. moment is like, what the fuck is about to happen? Oh, your home is a miracle. It's beautiful. Daniel is at that level of <laughs> drunk. <laughs> You know, this is the, I've been drunk for six months. I passed out drunk. I'm waking up still drunk. Like, this is a man barely, barely able to stand level of drunk. Oh, yeah. To be here and find you and see you well is wonderful. And we have a chance to catch up. What do you feel about Eli in this moment? John? <laughs> <laughs> yeah right thanks for that that softball there um you know it is so bizarre on the one hand that eli would ever yeah ever just decide to cross paths with daniel <laughs> again mix that with the fact that this guy's blacked out and mm-hmm. just by hearing eli's voice or saying his name He's almost like, ooh, the game is still on. Like, okay, we cool, we oh, get to keep point. playing because I haven't been playing in so long. I, I'm not living anymore. So mm-hmm. I, I almost feel like he's fired up about that. But honestly, why Eli is leading with this stuff? Like, you know, you, my only thought about him is what is his real motivation here? Mm-hmm. How is he going to somehow blackmail, do something? He's an enigma almost. It's just shocking that he would come back there. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Like, he must need something, right? As you said, why would he ever come back? Ever. Ever? Clearly, he must need something. And Steve and John, I'm sure you guys know, as soon as someone shows up back into your life and the first thing they do is to butter you up, you know what the next thing is that yeah. is coming after the buttering up. It is a request for something, and they must for know something. that it's going to ask a lot of you if they're buttering you up right off the bat. Does he have any belief in the things that he's saying? We've seen ups and downs, haven't we? Are things down for you right now, Eli? No. No. Uh, no. But I do come with some sad news. Mr. Bandy has passed on to the Lord. Does he have any expectation that Daniel has any positive emotions, any remotely positive emotions at all about any of this? Well, he's just doing what Daniel does to him, though. He's just, Mm. oh, talking this, well, yes, we can, no. I mean, maybe he's not as good at it as Daniel, but no, no, this is, it's all bullshit. I mean, he knows there was, how could someone who dragged you by through, by your hair through the mud, Mm -hmm. how, how are you, oh, we've had our ups and downs. No, you have an enemy and that's who you're talking to right now. Right. So I'm not buying anything coming out of his mouth. Nothing. You know, you know what? I totally agree. And this is, I finally figured out what it is, is that he is putting forth, it goes way, way back to when Daniel says, what do you want the money for? And he goes, for my church. <laughs> is that that moment was bullshit. Yeah. And now, 20, 30 years later, whatever it is, he is presenting more bullshit, knowing that it's bullshit, mm. knowing that Daniel knows it's bullshit. And that's part of the game because... He believes he is certain he can get what he wants from Daniel because he has faith in Daniel's greed. And so he's doing the little bullshit dance ahead of time. Sure. Um, yeah. Because he ends up with, 
I'm offering you to drill on one of the great undeveloped fields of Little Boston. And Daniel, without missing a beat, says, I'd be happy to work with you. <laughs> God damn. He's luring him in. Oh, yeah. Because Daniel already knows. Like, if you're showing up in my house, and I'm sure Daniel, there's no way Daniel's like, oh, I haven't been paying attention to your life. There's no way his bitterness or his pettiness doesn't extend to watching Eli's son. He probably maniacally or with glee, maniacal glee, watches Eli's sermons if they're broadcast on TV or if he's or listens to them with like a bowl of popcorn snickering his ass off the whole time, I would imagine. And here's the other thing to keep in mind. What did he just do? His son, adopted or otherwise, just came in and asked for something way smaller than what Eli is asking for. Yeah. And he brutalizes him. And now Eli comes and asks for a thing. And he says, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to work with you. Yes, yes, of course. That's wonderful. But there is one condition for this work. All right. I'd like you to tell me that you are and have been a false prophet and that God is a superstition. <laughs> and Eli says, but that's a lie. Does Eli think that's a lie? Or oh. does he know that's the truth? Uh, yeah, I think it's, a, he, I think he knows he's been lying to himself about all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he probably senses what Dan, the game Daniel is playing because this is Daniel still fighting the battle as john just mentioned earlier has he's awakening it's like it's like that scene in dark knight returns right when the joker's been quiet and all of a sudden bruce wayne shows back up and the smile creeps back into his lip mm. he lips and he hasn't smiled in 30 years this is essentially that daniel's probably been a fall down drunk for a number of years and it isn't until eli shows back up again that he is reawakened as john said and so mm. Now the, the battle of wills in, in ensues and the unfinished battle of wills. So he said he wants him to admit that he was a false prophet from the beginning yeah. so you can have a petty victory over him in the end. I was just going to talk about, like, does Eli believe this? Mm. And you know how broken people know they're broken? Yes. I mm -hmm. think Eli might believe it. Like, yeah, no, that's a lie. You can't say that. I don't believe in it, and I'm manipulating people from my church, but I know that there's people that believe in this, and it's real, so I think maybe I could get there one day. I mean, wh whatever it is, I, I'm, it's not all bad, but I'm doing it real, <laughs> so here's my validation for it. Yeah, I yeah. kind of feel like that's happening a little bit. Like He's working outside of it, but maybe he believes that it is real on some level. He just can't tap into it. Here's what I think. First of all, before I say that, uh, at first I didn't understand what you were saying about Dark Knight Returns, and now I think that is 100% a hundred percent exactly yeah. what's happening. <laughs> You're totally right. This has brought him back to life. Yes. This guy's showing up. Here's the second thing. I think this scene is the baptism. I think this is an absolute 100% parallel revenge for the baptism. And I think that deep down, Eli knows that he is a false prophet and that God is a superstition, but he has lied to himself and repressed that knowledge and gone, well, I'm doing good and I'm helping people. And he's created an image of himself that he can live with, just as Daniel Plainview denied the fact that he had abandoned his child. Mm. Uh, and that yeah. what is about to happen is good that points. Daniel Plainview is going to force him to say it. I would like... A $100,000 signing bonus plus the five that is owed to me with interest. Which means he never did pay him that $5,000. Nope, he yeah. never did. And you know that Daniel is lying because he has negotiated every single price, every single deal for the entire movie. And now he just says, that's only fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Eli goes, okay. And at first he says it like he just says the words. I am a false prophet and god is a superstition if that's what you believe then i will say it say it like you mean it daniel say it like it's your sermon and he stands up and he kind of says it and then daniel mm. gives him some directions and it's exactly what happens in the baptism say it louder mm. say it louder. get on your knees and say it just imagine this is your church here and um, you have a full congregation so and then Eli says it. I am a false prophet. God is a superstition. Say it again. And I think it's just like what happens with Daniel in the baptism. There's this moment that he's saying the words. And then there's a moment that he's feeling the words. Mm -hmm. And it becomes real. I am 
A false prophet, God is a superstition. I can't hear you at the back. I am a false prophet, God is a superstition. Say it again. I am a false prophet, God is a superstition. Say it again. I am a false prophet, God is a superstition. This is an amazing revenge to me. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Far more. This is more of a revenge to me than what is about to happen. Mm. Um, and he says, after he's gotten what he wants, wants, Daniel says, Those areas have been drilled. Oh, they have Yes, it's, uh, it's called drainage, Eli. See, I own everything around it, so of course uh, I get what's underneath it. And Eli had this whole plan. He had worked <laughs> everything out. He knew there was oil there. That was what was going to solve all his problems. But there are no derricks there. This is uh, the bandy track. Do you understand? Do you understand, Eli? That's more to the point. Do you understand? I drink your water. I drink it up. Every day, I drink the blood of lamb from Bandit's tract. And then this is where the truth comes out. I am, I am in desperate times. I know. I need a friend. Yes, of course you do. <laughs> it's so beautiful, man. It's petty as hell, but it's beautiful, my God. I need help. I'm a sinner. How has he sinned? Oh, certainly taken the money and spent it on like probably cars and houses and whatever. He's probably slept with the wives of his parishioners like crazy. Maybe he's even fathered illegitimate children as these leaders of these religious cults or sects, sects usually do. Those are my, those were the things that popped into my head and have always popped into my head. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, it's, I, I, for whatever reason, sexual pro sexual, Hijinks mm. is the first thing that comes up to me. Yep. I think he's done all the stuff. I think he's done it all. I've let the devil grab a hold of me in ways I never imagined. I'm so full of sin. The Lord sometimes challenges us, doesn't he, Lord? Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Daniel, yes, he does. Yes, he does. He completely failed to alert me to the recent panic in our economy. It's clearly 1929. He's invested a lot of money in the stock market. This is the thing. I think he. I think he thinks there is a god. Oh yes, that's what. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but I don't think he sees the fact because if there is a god and if God gives you what you deserve, none of which I believe, but mm -hmm. if you did believe that, he's not seeing the fact that he's a terrible, terrible person, and that is why he's getting what he's getting. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think he's. I think he can't see that. I, mean, yeah. I think in the, in the same way, Daniel. Maybe Daniel does have self awareness about himself, but Eli can't see that. And I do agree. He do, he does think that there's a God. He's trying to play the game, but he's a piece of shit, and he can't. And it's like I don't know why my investments aren't working. Like, well, this money that you're taking from people, and you're you're trying to get rich, and that you know, he. He knows there's a pious path, I think. And he really could actually walk it if he wanted to and be poor and have a shit house little church and, and actually do God's work there. Mm. And like take take the non-reward. That that is the reward. Just try to help people. He could do that, but he's mm -hmm. definitely chosen not to do that. And he's like, oh, why? <laughs> it's not working out for me. God isn't listening. He's a child. He's a, he's a fucking child. child. In that moment, yeah. he's a fucking child being like, he does these things and I don't understand. Yeah. And yeah. Like he's manipulative, him. but he's yeah. a child. Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, and this is the thing. I don't think Daniel Plainview would ever have gotten caught by the stock market. Oh, no. He's got his investments figured out every which way. Mm -hmm. But this guy does not. And now the revenge is not over. It was Paul who was chosen. He, he found me and told me about your land, which is to fall. Why are you talking about I did what your brother Don't couldn't say this broke to me. you and I beat you. It was Paul talking about you. He's the prophet. He's the smart one. He knew what was there and he found me to take it out of the ground. You know what the funny thing is? Listen, listen, listen. I paid him $10,000 cash in hand. Which isn't true. That is Which a lie. is not true. Yeah. Stop crying, you sniveling ass. Stop your nonsense. You're just 
after birth, Eli. No. To slithered out on your mother's filth. No. I mean, that is... It's brutal. I mean, oh. ca- calling a dude an after... And, and what I wonder, too, has Daniel correctly pegged Eli's insecurity about his twin brother, Paul? Hmm. Is hmm. this a thing for him? I don't know. I don't really have a handle on how Eli thinks about Paul, except for I know I kind of feel like I know how Paul felt about Eli. Mm. And Paul was sort of, you know, Paul could have been pious. He could have been he could have been a religious guy. He could have been, you know, the the better Eli. He was very calm and very composed and very smart. And he tried to make a deal with Daniel and he bailed. Um, I previously when we were talking we were talking about how eli was probably running the household he was dominant he was mm. you know, manipulative <clears throat> i maybe there was a competition with paul but i don't know mm-hmm. and right as he hits him with this angle of attack he switches back to the first angle of attack that land has been had nothing you can do about it. it's gone it's had. if you would just you take this lease daniel Train! Drainage, boy. <laughs> Drainage, Eli. If you have a milkshake, and I have a milkshake, and I have a straw, there it is. That's a straw, you see. And he holds up the imaginary straw with his fingers. He says, watch it. And he walks down the lane of the bowling alley. My straw reaches a cross through. And starts to drink your milkshake. I'll tell you the the hobbling he does as he's going across. It is brilliant, right? That's an old man hobbling the knees and all of that. Especially if he's drunk. Especially if he's just woken up. You know, the body's not going to be fully erect. So it almost drives the point even more. Uh, oh, drives the point home even more that he is hobbling his drainage and he just all the way across to really dig the knife in and take his time getting this revenge uh, on Eli. This is his moment. This is the, this is the moment that is like the payoff. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. By the way, this, I drink your milkshake stuff comes from uh, the teapot dome scandal, which is in the twenties. And Doheny, who Daniel Plainview is somewhat based on, was involved Mm. in this. And this was basically during the Harding administration, bribing a whole bunch of government officials for a bunch of oil men to get access to a bunch of government lands to drill and pull up oil. And frequently they were drilling in one place to suck up oil from someone else. And that is when someone came up with this milkshake straw metaphor. Uh, And by the way, it was actually used fairly recently. Pete uh, Domenici of New Mexico brought up this milk milkshake thing when talking about the Arctic wildlife refuge and drilling there. So this wow. is, well, and the thing is literally right now, just uh, yesterday, I watched Katie Porter talking to mm. uh, oil representatives about drilling in uh, American uh, federal lands. Mm. So these issues, these Daniel Plainview <laughs> milkshake issues, they're still happening. Don't bully me, Daniel. <laughs> And Daniel just tosses Eli onto the bowling lane. And what's what's so brutal, if the previous, if the milkshake had been the end of the revenge, I think it would have been, that would have been not justified, but like Mm. satisfying in a way. What happens next is horrible. Murder. Did you think your song and dance and your superstition would help you, Eli? And he bowls and hits him in the foot, which looks like it hurts. And he starts throwing bowling balls at him. And Eli yells, I'm your old friend, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he could possibly think that. Yeah, I mean, it's such a weird, I mean, he has no one, though. He's desperate. Yeah. yeah, he's desperate. And I love it. It's something we saw at the very beginning when the oil splashed the lens. Now he hits this bucket in the bowling, bowling alley, and that sprays the lens. And Daniel Plainview grabs a bowling pin, and Eli is running away, crawling, begging for his life. And Daniel hits him, and he goes down. And we're in a low angle, looking up at Daniel with the bowling pin. And you could see, for me, that the first hit was instinct and anger. Yeah. 
And then when he stares down at him, unconscious probably, on the ground, mm -hmm. the next hit is deliberate murder. <laughs> the pause is everything, right? Because the pause is... You could you could put in so many thoughts, don't you think, Steve and John? Like in that moment, he's like, ah, shit, what have I done? Should I do this? Yes, I'm going to do this. Or shit, the game is over. The mm. battle is over. Mm. If I do this, I will essentially remove my, not my greatest adversary, but an adversary that I have, uh, that has woken me from my sleep. Do I want to do this? And so I, I just want you can fill that pause with so much possibility. Do you think in that pause that he has any regard or concern for the law? No, I, no, I don't know. Because the, so. there's possibility, possibly because the pause. Right. If it, it, yeah. and it isn't even a crime of passion, because yeah. a crime of passion is just like, ah, this was right. more like, boom. And then he's almost surprised that Eli has gone down so quickly. And then he makes the decision to go forward. So it's almost like, fuck it, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I I keep going back, John, to your Dark Knight Returns metaphor because it's mm. like this person brought him back to life. This is the yeah. only thing left in the world that gives him any sense of being alive, and he is now killing that. Yeah. the The servant comes in and walks in on this horrible, horrible moment, and Daniel Plainview is sitting in the center of the lane looking back at him and turns and says, I'm finished. And we hear classical music and he sits for a while breathing and then we go to black. It is such a distressing <laughs> and unsettling yeah. ending of a film. Yeah. yeah, I was just overwhelmed by the moment. I remember standing up in the theater and clapping at that ending because... Wow. I thought it was a beautiful ending to a film like this. Not that I agree with what he did. It's right. more a matter of like artistically is a brilliant ending. Paul Thomas Anderson exists on a whole nother plane as a director. And yeah, as I a agree. Storyteller, right? Yeah. And I, I, mean, I feel like with this one specifically, all of his movies, mm. this one specifically, the script, yeah. specifically Daniel's lines. Yes. Everything is edited down and whittled down to a concentrated Daniel. So the, I'm finished. Yeah. It's like, yeah, with every, I mean, it means so many things in that moment. It does. Yeah. This whole lifetime of a battle, it's over now. Right. Him, he's done, you know, and like, yep. I, I get the feeling in this moment, like, he doesn't really care. It's no. okay. Like, he's not upset. Yeah. Or yeah. He, he made the decision to murder. He made, like, well, I'm done now. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think he lives much longer. No, I think he dies that uh, night. Uh, oh, yeah, that night. Yeah, I think he absolutely dies that night. And I'll tell you why. Because I think the connection with Eli is also the connection to his son. Everything yeah. went fucking sideways when I came to that town and got involved with this Eli kid. And everything um, came off of that. And yes, I became rich. And yes, I was all this. Young, but I lost my son. I lost Mary. I lost any connection to any family I might have had. Yeah. I became a bitter, angry, frustrated, drunk old man. Yeah. Yep. And I'm finished, in essence, is him saying I'm done with life. Yeah, like, that's uh, how I feel. And you can almost go even deeper and go like, what was the point? Because oh. he achieved all this madness, or all the sorry, all this richness and wealth and 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 power, yet he still succumbed to a petty battle of wills with someone who was way beneath him in terms of status, intelligence, and ability. Uh, and so it's almost like I'm finished. Like I'm, I can't do it. I'm done. I'm done. You know? So we got a question from one of our patrons, Anthony Palms, mm. who says, uh, hi guys, your show remains a highlight each week. That's awesome. Thank he you. says, uh, this is a sort of a question or perhaps just an observation. At the end of There Will Be Blood, when Daniel Plainview beats Eli to death with a bowling pin, the scene has always reminded me of the first ape murdering another <laughs> in Kubrick's 2001. <laughs> and he says, and the color and symmetry of Daniel's in-home bowling alley mm. looks like the blood elevator in the hallway in Kubrick's Shining. Do mm. we think that have made it been a deliberate filmic echo by Paul... Thomas Anderson about mankind's violence or simply a cinematic coincidence? First of I, all, I, good, John, good, John. I'm not buying it. 
And I think it's a really awesome comment by a clearly awesome uh, listener. Yeah. But I just don't think that's Paul's way. I do not think he does those kinds of things. He could have, but I bet you it's more of a happy accident. Just yeah. my gut. I have no proof of this. I was just going to say that's a fantastic question. I yeah. didn't even consider it, and I would have to go back and rewatch it, kind of compare it to even remotely think I could answer the question. But all I'll say is I'll echo John's point. What a fantastic question, and what a yeah. brilliant connection that you're making there. And isn't that such an amazing thing about movies that mm-hmm. we can? I mean, which is why I'm sure all of your listeners and the three of us love movies so much because mm-hmm. once the direct, once it's color time or whatever, it's done. So, right, it's not theirs anymore. It's ours. It can never change. We can watch it as many times as we want. And we can see different things and we can think what we want to think about them. And that's, for me, that's everything. And yeah. so I'm, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope <laughs> your listener is right. And Paul is like, yep, that's exactly what I was doing. Um, I have no idea, of course. I, my gut is that this is influence, not reference. I my gut is that PTA obviously has watched those movies mm-hmm. and they they those images are profound images that sit deep in you but I don't know that he was consciously doing it that mm-hmm. that's that would be my gut and and whenever Paul Thomas Anderson wants to come on as a guest of the Cinephiles <laughs> we'd be happy to discuss this with you um in post production uh this is one of the interesting things Paul Thomas Anderson said. So we talked about the fact that he likes things simple and classic. And one of the reasons he likes to shoot on film is that he says he has enough trouble making his decisions with the options that he has. And John, I'm sure you could talk to this, is that there was this idea when people started doing things digitally that everything would get easier and faster and cheaper. <laughs> In fact, it was the opposite because more you have more and more choices and more and more producers and directors are like, well, let me see that and let me see that and let me see that. When you cut on film and shoot on film, the film is the film. When you shoot like raw off of a you know 4K or an 8K thing, <laughs> you could do all sorts of stuff with it. You could completely change it. You could do almost anything. And Paul, PTA didn't want all those options. Um, yeah it's totally true like he's you know just for cost like you're gonna shoot on film your cost is ridiculously high and i love what he's saying he's like i I know what we want to do here we want to shoot all these scenes let's do what we've planned on doing and then we'll figure out how to make it perfect whereas to your point if you're shooting 4k whatever and you can shoot as much as you want you can shoot infinite varieties of things to cover yourself and if you're an insecure filmmaker and you got your two or three editors that are coming in late, you know, and hacking everything up with their frame fucking. It's just going to go on and you're going to have endless options and nothing's going to change fundamentally because that's not what you're doing. You're just changing little things to see if the studio people are going to like it more. So, yeah, I, I, I really respect yeah. him for that. The uh, film was dedicated to Robert Altman, who died while they were filming. This is a big mentor of PTAs. Uh, It won the Silver Bear for Best Director in Berlin in 2008. It grossed $76.2 million against a $25 million budget. This was Paul Thomas Anderson's most successful film. It's nominated for eight Oscars, picture director, actor, adapted screenplay, art direction, cinematography, sound editing. It was not nominated for score because Greenwood's score contained music from another project of his, Popcorn Superhead Receiver. And so it wasn't all original music, so it couldn't get a nomination for score. It won uh, for actor, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis won, and it won for cinematography. Picture that year, as we discussed uh, before, went to No Country for Old Men. And supporting actors uh, were Javier Bardem, who won for No Country for Old Men, Casey Affleck, (laughs) Philip Seymour Hoffman for Charlie Wilson's War, Casey Affleck was for Assassination of Jesse James, and Hal Holbrook for Into the Wild. A lot of people put this on the list of not only the best films of the year, but the best films of the decade or even the young century. Mm. (laughs) By the way, uh, the director of photography, whose name just went out of my head, uh, he saw this movie like a year or two later. He he watched it and went, wow, you know what? I really did deserve the fucking Academy Award for this. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, you did. 
Uh, gentlemen, do you have final thoughts? This has been a huge, huge journey through this movie. Mm -hmm. Do you have final thoughts? What did this movie mean? Yeah. I think when you talk about, you know, the American dream, this is another American dream story, rags to riches or whatever. It has the same elements of what is the American dream, right? Like, you know, that, that the big American money thing never really ends the way you wanted it to. But <clears throat> I don't know so much that there's a meaning in this movie. I don't always think that a movie has to mean something. That's just my take for me. It's a character study. It's a it's it's a, it's a, a time and a place, and it's seeing something fantastic. And I say that with like fantastic, like weird, happen in decades and decades living with this Daniel guy. And for me, it's really just watching him and his experience. So for me, I think it's just a, a masterclass, not on technical stuff, but just on how to make a compelling movie. For me. Frame one sucks me in. I'm there for the running time completely <clears throat> until it's over. That's what I love about it is that it captivates me every single frame. I, I think for me, it's what it symbolizes, right? What it harkens to, which is the great classics of years past. Immediately when you walked out of this movie, you knew you'd seen something that was new yet old at the same time. And yeah. it was brilliant. The performance of, of Daniel Day-Lewis is astounding. Um, the um, journey it takes you on, the chances it takes, uh, the guts it has, um, and the fact that it made 75 million, as Steve pointed out, that's three times its budget for a film about oil set in the 1800s, 1900s. That's insane. But it yeah. harkens back to the great films of that of the of the years past. And I think that's the real power within the movie. And that's yes, a really good point. Right. Yes, the exploration of humanity, the exploration yeah. of man and the desire to achieve uh, in America and to be the self-made man. And what does that lead to the self-made man that doesn't work on himself and rather works on his business? What does that lead to? There's so much to explore and, and break down in that if you were to take that character of Daniel Plainview and just kind of explore for a while. So that's what I love about the movie, too, is that yeah. no matter how many times you watch it, you can take even more out of it to discuss and think about and ponder and we scratch it. We, we talked about it on three parts. And this is just our our conversation for it in 2021. If we were to yeah. meet again in 2031, we might have completely different points Ooh. of views about the whole situation, about the, everything situ happens in the movie and whatever. And that's the joy of a movie like this. And I also think um, it reminds us that what we're what we're happening in our world now has been happening for centuries and for decades. And people need to remember that uh, we repeat patterns all the time. And we sometimes forget to learn the lessons as a country and as a society. And I, and I mm. love that about mm. this movie. I think for me, first of all, you know, we spend so much time talking about the way films are made on this mm. podcast. And like, I think this shows so clearly the way artistry has to be built upon craftsmanship yeah. is that, the craftsmanship is masterful throughout every shot, every piece of music, the performances, the costumes, the, the, the design, everything is perfect. And then you go beyond that to these things that are un, I can understand craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. Artistry goes into areas sometimes that you can't logically understand. And Daniel Day Lewis's performance and elements of the script and what the meaning of the end is, and what is Eli all about, and things like the baptism scenes, things like the murder of the of the son, um, the murder of the brother, and scenes like that final scene with his with H W. Mm -hmm. I it, it goes beyond the, just the craftsmanship of storytelling for me. And I think too, and this is going to sound really strange. So I do this other podcast on Star Trek, and one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is that the original series is really a discourse often on what are the right choices in life. Mm -hmm. And so often there are these things where someone went after a goal thinking that that was what life was about and they ended up in a trap because they yeah. didn't understand what the real values of life is. And what's cool about Star Trek is that they're not just giving you an answer. They're asking a lot of difficult questions. And mm -hmm. I think for me, these two incredibly charismatic, successful, intelligent, driven people, everything they're doing is in the wrong direction. Mm. And so even though they are accomplishing in all these ways, all this stuff, 
they are doing so at the detriment of their own lives. Hmm. And, and hmm. that is how I feel at the end is just the wastefulness of all of it. Hmm. Hmm. So that's what we think about There Will Be Blood. Of course, we'd love to hear what you think. You could visit us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for The Cinephiles. You can follow the show at Cine underscore files on, t- on Twitter, Cinephiles Podcast on Instagram. Subscribe to the show. Like, if you haven't subscribed to the show at this point, <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. You should go to Spotify or Apple Podcasts or YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts, and hit the subscribe button, and then go, oh, oops, I really should go back to Apple Podcasts and also leave a review. That would be fantastic. <laughs> or leave a comment on uh, YouTube. We love interacting with you there. If you want to buy or stream, there will be blood along with every other movie we've ever reviewed. You can do so at Cinephiles Net. And if you want to suggest a film, listen to our Cinephile shorts, or even ask questions that might be read on a future episode of The Cinephiles, you can do that at patreon.com slash The Cinephiles. And if you want to find me, you could do it at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. Star Trek podcast is Enterprise Incidents. John, how would people find you? You can always find me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you want to head on over to Twitch, follow me there. The outlaw nation, all one word, uh, doing some play alongs and watch alongs there. My YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca says, uh, and of course my pod, my other podcasts, the top 10 and the geek buddies all hanging out there, having some fun in the world of entertainment. And John Grieber, I got to tell you, I have a real love for candy, but I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> How You've would I find something right- delicious to eat? Well, listen, if you want to find some really good candy and some immature middle-aged guys talking about it, go to candygurus.com. We just redesigned the site. We try to, yeah, I know, it's weird. Like, why am I reviewing candy? We just started 10 years ago to try to get some free stuff. It's been working. And (laughs) we have a lot of weird stuff from Europe, a lot of cool stuff. So candygurus.com, and we're on on, uh, Instagram at candygurus, Twitter, YouTube. And if you want to follow me, I'm only on Instagram at split surround. And I want to thank you two guys for having me here. This was so awesome. Well, please. no, thank you. You've been yeah. fantastic. You, yeah. you fit right into the cinephiles family. And I think you should give some thought to some other movies you might want to discuss down the line. You know, I have been, back. and I will. Thank you guys. That means a lot. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Thank you. And I think that is it for this week. We will see you next time for another great film on the cinephiles. <laughs>